I'm Randy Levy, head of the Children's Library. Thank you for joining us for this exceptional event. The library is able to host programs like this with the support of our members and friends. We thank you for your contributions, large or small, to our annual fund. Okay. Who likes secrets? <laughs> Me too. Today, we're going to learn some secrets secrets about being a writer. I'm honored to introduce two beloved authors who will share their secrets about being writers today, Elizabeth Winthrop and Richard Peck. They are two very longtime members of our spectacular library. Between the two of them, they have been reading and writing at the Society Library for a combined total of 73 years. <laughs> Elizabeth Winthrop is an award-winning writer of over 60 books for children and adults featuring unforgettable characters like Grace, William and Sir Simon, and last but certainly not least, Dumpy LaRue. <laughs> Hailing from a family of writers, Elizabeth Winthrop has been a member of the Society Library since 1975. Richard Peck commenced his writing career in 1971, the day he left a teaching position at Hunter College High School. Since then, he has authored nearly 50 books and won numerous awards, including the Newbery Medal, the Margaret Edwards Award for Lifetime Achievement in Young Adult Literature, and the Edgar Mystery Award. He has twice been nominated for a National Book Award and has received a National Humanities Medal. The Best Man is his newest book, featuring Archer McGill, a boy, on his way to being the best man he can be. It has received rave reviews and, to date, has been selected for six best of 2016 lists, including the New York Times and the New York Public Library. A lifelong reader, Richard Peck has been a member of the Society Library since, 1970, excuse me, since 1984. We are thrilled to have both authors here today to share with all of us their tales of becoming and being a writer. Prepare yourself to learn the secrets and tips that are essential to the process for all who want to know, how do I become a writer? Ladies and gentlemen, readers, we gathered in one of our favorite places, the New York Society Library, the oldest library in New York, and older than the United States, <laughs> because it was founded in 1745. The year Elizabeth and I joined. <laughs> 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 and they've been serving readers ever since, and harboring writers. Upstairs, there are cubicles where writers can write like medieval monks hoping to illuminate their manuscripts. Uh, I don't write here. Do you? I do. You do. I can't write here because I can't carry my electric typewriter all the way. <laughs> and I have to use an electric typewriter for several reasons, one of which is I never lost a young reader to an electric typewriter. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I'm up and down the open stacks, though, and I found novels in there that I was to write. I found letters from Civil War soldiers because I needed a voice for a Civil War novel called The River Between Us. I fall backwards into books up there, hanging for gold, trying to unlock the secrets of writers long dead. And I hauled the card catalog to downstairs, the last card catalog <laughs> you will ever see. <laughs> card catalogs never crash. <laughs> uh, my, story, my novels owe a great deal to this place because nobody but a reader ever became a writer. And you hope that every book beginning in the library will end there. A story is a secret shared, and Elizabeth and I are going to share some of our writing secrets with you, some not all. 
<laughs> to, in fact, the importance of the right opening line, because you haven't found it yet, and the importance of finding a voice for your, to tell your story because you, you cannot tell it in your own. Uh, so, two secrets on how to build a book. How the story begins and who's going to tell it. Starting at the, I start at the beginning. Uh, and, right, page one, chapter one. On a blank page. It needs to be a page from the beginning. Never trust a screen. <laughs> uh, so, I start writing as if I'm reading the book, not writing it. After all, I don't know what it's about, so I have to write it. And when I can no longer read the page for the corrections, I retype that page. And when I retype it, I find three things I didn't catch earlier. <laughs> it's said that revising is so much easier on a computer. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to hurt. <laughs> Happy writing makes for sad. <laughs> so, uh, I, when I can no longer read the page, I retype it. And then, when I get it just exactly the way I want it, I take out 20 words. <laughs> you can get 20 words out of the tightest page you ever wrote and should. When you're young, you say, how long does it have to be? When you're old, you say, how short can I make it? <laughs> uh, and so, back and forth, back and forth, weeks bleed into months. And I still, I try to know what the ending is, but that's a snare and a delusion. I was writing to a last line in this book, which was engraved on my heart, and then only one day I came to it and put it in and gave it to my editor. And she said, Okay, so far, but there's no ending. <laughs> Would I have had to be in a book with no ending? Apparently, I did. Uh, it wasn't the last line of the book. It was just the line I had fallen in love with. Usually, you need to take out those lines entirely, but I'm not giving it up. It's the last line of the penultimate chapter because there was a need for another chapter. Well. I had an unsuitable title, never mind what it was. I, I've often had 28 titles before I could find the right one. Uh, but I handed it in, and the editor said, mm -hmm, that title won't work. And I did what you do then. I went to prom. <laughs> Place to hide now, is there? I would get an email saying, title. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, the big scary question what one was I must have the title today because the art department requires it. <laughs> Never mind about my knees. <laughs> uh, and she said, if you don't come up with it, I will. She did. <laughs> New York Times swallowed it whole. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have used this title if I thought of it because it's a play by Gore Vidal. But she said, who cares? <laughs> so uh, that was the easy way to get a title. <laughs> and Prague's not that expensive. <laughs> and then we come to the importance. Well, I, I back and fill, and a year passes longer than that with this one because this is almost the first thing I have written about the 21st century, not a place where I am much at home. <laughs> and so I had a lot of trouble with the technology and what kids would have. And you ask teachers what kids are doing with their phones and they tell you one thing and you ask parents and they tell you something completely different. So finally, I have to write fiction. <laughs> um, I hope for the best. When I get to the end and see how the story finishes, without rewriting it, I go back to the first chapter and throw it away. Now, I, and only now, am I ready.
to write the first chapter now that I know how it ends. Mm -hmm. Because the first chapter is the last chapter in disguise. And I've been warming up. And you can't warm up on young people's reading written time. So that's what I do times 45. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, the most important rock lines you will write, apart from the title, and now you know you can get the editor's name. But uh, you have to work very hard on getting the first line right. I never have the first line the first time. Sometimes I have 40 first lines. Sometimes it's later in my own this work. And sometimes it isn't. I spend an hour a week in the bookstore copying out other people's opening lines. <laughs> Just to give me some inspiration. Most of them aren't any good, but you learn from the best. And we have editors now who don't know a good opening line from a bad one. So. <laughs> and uh, mine isn't quite bad, but most are. Uh, so. You want an opening line that will grab the reader there. Uh, and I'm sorry, to, and I keep an archive. I'm sorry to tell you that the best opening line in American English has already been written. <laughs> and here it is. Where's Papa going with that ass? <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. It fits on one line. It doesn't need and it puts Papa and Axe on the same, in the same uh, sentence. It's perfect. You have to read on. Uh, and then, here's another one have it for a book that's done quite well. When my brother Jim was almost 13, he got his arm badly broken. is not perhaps the most widely read novel of the 20th century. What is it? Still a mockingbird. No, this she did not begin. It seemed to be a sleepy little southern town where nothing ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> Never start with setting. Our readers don't know geography. <laughs> uh, and notice it didn't start with, I had a, a father named Atticus Finch, and I worship the ground you walk on. That's true, and that's what the novel's about, but it doesn't go in the first line. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. It's where he began. But the specific, and the auditory, you can hear it crack. And the precision of it, he was almost 13. Uh, that's the way they do it. Did she get it the first time out? I doubt it. She probably found it on page six. I often find my titles on page six. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. And you throw out the first five and you're rolling. But never settle for your first idea. It's no good. And then a more recent book by Carmen Agredivi called The Cheshire Cat. He was the best of Tom's. He was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so, big secret number one is finding the opening line, and you'll have to look for it. And where did they come from? My last book, not the newest one, but the last one is called The Mouse with the Question Mark Tail. And I found the opening for it on page 124 in the middle of a paragraph. <laughs> what was it doing there? But, yeah, I found it and, and put it on the front page and threw out the old beginning. And it is, I share it with you. Every time a human walks out of a room, something with more feet walks in. <laughs> <laughs> that was a title, but came to me after about 11 months of writing. Mice, of course, were only a whisker away and everywhere you fail to look. 
It's true of the room where I'm sitting. It's truer still of Buckingham Palace. How busy the scampering world of mice within the palace walls through, through that mouse hole just behind the throne. How busy the royal views next door, where the royal carriages are kept in the royal houses stable beneath the clattering cobblestones of the royal mews, a whole private honeycomb of mouse pas passages crisscross and connect. One of them leads into the palace. <laughs> That's a table of contents for the book. <laughs> uh, you can get into the palace if you're as small as a mouse. And whom would you wish to meet once you The Queen! <laughs> and since it's 18, 1897, it's Queen Victoria. And when she's having a great night cup of tea, she lifts it off the saucer and guess who's sitting in the saucer. <laughs> so, but it's all anticipated at the beginning. Did I know it when I first wrote it? Of course not. So, save your best efforts for the first chap chapter and write it last. Uh, good titles are where you find I found one once on a visit to be the visiting author at a place called Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, if you're invited to a place called Grand Rapids, uh, to Calvin, <laughs> Calvin College, you know you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed I didn't, but <laughs> I got a novel out of it, which is better. Uh, Calvin College does what every college ought to do. They bring in public school students, or grade school and junior high students from their area for a day of writing with an author. And then they identify the bright kids, and the kids get to see their very handsome campus. So they said, uh, you will have eighth graders in the morning and seventh graders in the afternoon, 45 minutes with each group, teach them how to write. <laughs> well, I was a teacher. I know that in 45 minutes, a class period, you can only do one concept. So I do the big one. You are only as good as your opening line. Your opening line should be a grenade with the pin already pulled. <laughs> However you want to say it. And I envisioned us sitting around the table and writing opening lines and then making them better. There were 500 fifth graders in stadium seating, and I was holding my uh, thrust stage, and there at the top were their teachers, already having asked if they had to stay for the program. <laughs> <laughs> but I just had one lesson planned, so you know what that means. And so I said, you are only as good as your opening line. 500 silent faces. I said, you will be rewarded if you have an opening line that interests your teacher. What interests a teacher? By a hundred silence. What That's all I had. What interests a teacher? And finally a voice there said, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Longest morning of my life, and then in the afternoon, here came the seventh graders, and it was the same lesson plan, even more inappropriate for them. They came in, uh, I was the only one in a room of 500 people not going through puberty. <laughs> <laughs> and I did my, what interest a teacher? Well, the idea of entertaining a teacher loosed some uh, naked hostility. Uh, these people are not to be entertained, they're to be brought down. Uh, there was much hair throwing among the girls. I don't do that part very well. Uh, it's a quad interest of teacher four times, and then a voice said, a breaking voice voice said, Trouble. Yes, yes, yes. Put trouble in the open. Well, I don't know if they believe me, but I believe me. And I had written an opening line just to you sharing you didn't ever get to do. Yeah. Uh, so important are opening lines that there is a, a, a prize called the coffee for the best opening line of the year. And I'm happy to tell you, I won it with my Grand Rapids for this book. If 
your teacher has to die. August isn't a bad time of year for it. <laughs> <laughs> this occasion, my first standing ovation from fifth grade. <laughs> but then I had to write a whole novel that went with it. And that's not the usual way, for me at least. But um, it was too good a line not to use. And it won that prize. It also won a prize from the Catholic Librarians. <laughs> if I'd try, been trying to cater to Catholic Librarians, I don't think I would have written that book. But see, you never know that. Uh, so, uh, writing is, uh, opening lines are important. Will you read yours, Elizabeth? Oh, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> this is all right to me. <laughs> well, I wanted to say that actually line, open lines and voice sort of move together for me. So in my case, I, I am not as stringent as Richard. I don't throw out my entire first chapter, but I take a very long time to get it right. And I cannot get it right until I have the voice. And this is a perfect example. This book, Counting on Grace, is about a little girl who is, uh, this picture was taken by a famous child labor photographer named Lewis Hine. I walked into a Vermont museum. I saw this picture. I did not know who she was. I did not want to know who she was. And I decided I would write a novel based on this little girl's face. So I did the research, and I figured she worked in a spinning, in a textile mill. She was a doffer, which means that you have to do off, take off the full bobbin here and replace it. Every minute that she is doing off the, the spinning, when she's working on the spinning frame, her mother is on what they call the loose pulley, which means that her mother is not paid. So can you imagine a child standing there working as fast as she can and her mother is yelling at her, faster, Grace, faster, because she's not being paid because Grace is taking a long time. I made Grace left-handed and I made Grace what we call in this day and age ADD. She could not concentrate, her feet moved when she talked, etc. Now when I came to write the book, I'd done a lot of research. Like Richard, I haunt the rooms in this library. And what I do, which is terrible, is I fall completely in love with the research. And then I have to write the novel. And the thing about research and novels is that the research, the writer has to know the tip. The reader has to sense the iceberg. If you do it the other way around, the reader feels yelled at and, and talked down to. So I fell in love with the research, so I thought, okay, well I'm gonna write this one. Third person, past tense, that didn't work. Then I decided I would write it half from Grace's voice and half from Lois Hines' voice. That didn't work. I wasn't getting anywhere. And finally I thought, all right, I'm gonna give this another try and I am simply going to write a journal in Grace's voice. I'm just going to pretend to be Grace and write what it's like every day to go to this mill and to live with her family. And that's voice. That's what worked. And I had never <coughs> written a book. This is very interesting. I don't know about you, Richard. I had never written a book in first person present tense before, which is really an immediate voice for readers right now. So my first line is tiny, but it is dialogue. And it is, Grace, your turn. <laughs> so again, I probably wrote Grace was sitting in the classroom and the teacher was hanging in there. And finally got to Grace, your turn, which I think drops you immediately into. It's not going to win any prizes. It's not going to be, but it grabs the reader. And she goes on to say, the book is called The Red Badge of Courage. I like that name. I stand up to read, but as soon as I open my mouth, my feet start moving. It always happens that way. I can't help it. And so she's already immediately in trouble. You want the characters to get into trouble immediately. You do not want fiction to be a boy looking out the window considering the clouds in the sky. You do not, you know, 
exactly as Richard's saying. You don't want to, not a lot of setting, not a lot of description. Grab them. Where's Papa going with that axe? I mean, that is, to my mind, the greatest first and, line. First, and first person. First it, that uh, intensifies the uniqueness. Absolutely intensifies. Now, my previous book that has done well was, was Castle in the Attic. That is third person past tense. It doesn't mean you can't get incredibly close to your character in third person. It's just every book teaches you what that book's about. Somebody once said, I think it was Flannery O'Connor, um, I don't know what the book's about until I write it. And why write it if I do know what it's about? <laughs> There's no point to writing the book. And that was exactly what happened with me. With this book, a weird thing happened not unlike with you. I got to the end of the book. I sent it to my editor. She said, that's great. You need a revision. Fine, I said, I love revising. It's not easy, but it's it's so, it's such a beautiful time with the book. And I read every book I write out loud. Yes. It's the only way I hear. I have a tendency, which I think many writers do, to word repeats. There'll be three justs on one page, two evens, or, or three alls. I'm in the middle of reading the book I've just finished, the draft of, so I'm very, very conscious. I read the book over, I revised it, I turned it in again, it was going to copy editing. And then I said, wait a minute, I cannot leave this girl in the dustbin of history. So I decided to go find her. Now Lewis Hine went into the spinning mill and, and couldn't hear her name because the spinning frame is so loud and so her name was on a huge billboard with a picture, which I later discovered didn't have her name right. They never age right, didn't have her name right, and it was the mill had been turned into a super fun site, so EPA, proud of itself, had put up a huge billboard for $1,800 saying, this is little 12-year-old Annie Laird. Her name was Addie Card. <laughs> I found her, I met her grandchildren, she was dead, she, nobody in the family knew that this picture has been on a Nike advertisement. It's been on a New York, I mean, a United States postage stamp. Yeah. This little girl. And I said to her, I said to her granddaughter, what did she die of? And she said, well, she died at 93 of lung cancer. And I said, well, it's probably the mill. She said, no, she smoked two packs. <laughs> <laughs> But as a result, when I thought the book was over and the editor thought the book was over, I called her up and I said, the book is not over. It's not fair. So there's a whole epilogue about finding Addie and what it meant. Now, I had no idea that I thought, no, she's just an inspiration. And then it turned into a whole other thing that happened. And I actually had her name corrected in the U.S. Library of Congress. They had her name wrong in so books take you on the, if you're a writer and you come to an empty page, you don't know where you're going. And you just get taken by the hand, by the character, and, and you're on a journey. And you give yourself permission to throw out most of it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And to throw out so many words on the page. Yes. Tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. But I do remember thinking, as a first novelist, how many pages should I make this book? Which has nothing to do with writing, no. exactly. And how long should it be? It's really how short can I make it? So true, so true. Everything she says is right. <laughs> <laughs> we all go through the same thing. Uh, but we, and I write, every, I read everything aloud because you're not writing about people sitting at the desk, you're writing about people and interacting and so I moved through the patterns. And, and, you, and you use different vocabulary when you're standing up. So uh, that's, I'm not, that's an added tip. Yeah. I'm not going to read you your opening, uh, my opening passage of The Best Man. Uh, we have heard Elizabeth's, but I'm going to read you another important point, play at another important place in the novel, and that is the epiphany. Uh, we have a uh, distinguished school librarian here today, Guy, 
will you tell us the importance of the epiphany, which <laughs> of, um, the epiphany in the best man? No, oh, oh, I'm doing that. <laughs> 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 uh, and get off my turf and tell of what, generally. Generally. What is it? <laughs> of revelation of some sort. Yes. Can you think of something in another book that I didn't write? <laughs> <laughs> It's the moment, a moment in the novel. I have two epiphanies in this one. Well, one's at a Halloween party. I often have epiphanies at parties, I notice, because it gets everybody on the stage. Uh, but the first epiphany is more than that. And it is something a boy learns he didn't know. And if we don't have those, we don't have a novel. Just as if we don't have conflict, we don't have a novel. I wanted to write a novel called The Best Man that had no, no villains in it. Everybody is going to act positively. Doesn't work. <laughs> you can't go to an American school without confronting really bad people. <laughs> <laughs> and he can, and, he, and he is mugged on the fir in first grade. So uh, I couldn't do that. Also, I wanted it to be light, but that didn't work either because you often lose someone dear to you. So often a grandfather. Yeah. And so that that told itself. Uh, by the time you after eight months, I, I for eight months I put words in their mouths, the characters. Mm -hmm. They're my little puppets. Mm -hmm. And after eight months, if there's no puppets, they have to go. <laughs> but one morning you will wake up and you will hear voices. Not in the first month or maybe year. Uh, this is a story. Uh, this is a story told by a boy. He's eleven, and once the story told itself, it did, it did what my boy stories always do. It's the relationship really between a father and a son. That's my favorite relationship. And so it is with th this uh, a quiet moment. But he's lost his. So he's lost one of his four male role models. The first death really is often a grandparent. And uh, his uncle was a man of great dignity who taught him several things his father didn't teach him. And you will see what they were. And also he was an avid Cubs fan, rabid Cubs fan. They all are. Uh, so, This follows his death. Dad, I said, do all grandpa's ashes have to go into the cemetery plot? We were stopped at a light. What do you have in mind? Dad said. I'm thinking maybe you and I and Uncle Paul could take a little bit of grandpa, maybe a handful, and scatter it on Wrigley Field. He'd like being there, he always did. The light changed. It's probably not legal, Dad said. No, I said that we could probably get away with it. <laughs> Down in the garage, we shook about a tablespoon of ashes into an envelope. Dad sealed the flap with scotch tape and handed the envelope to me. We, no, said, you and your Uncle Paul can take it from here. You screwed the lid back on the urn and left a half turn for me to do. Are we going to tell Grandma that Grandpa's not all here? Dad <laughs> said, not really, I said. Uncle Paul picked an away day for the Cubs for our visit. It was one of those days with the lake breeze rattling the ivy on the Wrigley Field walls and summer slipping away. We came out of, out of the dark in the concession area, and there it was, blue sky, green infield, diamond opening like a fan, one of the perfect places on this earth. It was pretty much all ours, so nobody especially noticed when I leaned out of the stands and poured an envelope of something off the table. <laughs> Play ball, Grandpa, I said, and we strolled on. 
Now we were up in the center field bleachers under the scoreboard. We had on sunscreen and our Cubs caps. It's better without a game, Uncle Paul said, half asleep with his cap pulled down. I was a little groggy with the sun, but I said, should we be sad about Grandpa? No. Who wouldn't want the life he had? Uncle Paul said it fitted like a glove. Also, I said, I think Dan wanted to give us a little time to talk. What about, do you suppose, Uncle Paul said? Search me, I said. Maybe he wanted us to talk about my teacher, Mr. McLeod, being gay. Maybe he wanted, maybe your dad wants us to talk about me being gay, Uncle Paul said. Whoa. The sun stopped at the top of the sky. You knew I was gay, right? Uncle Paul got up, sat up, pushed his ball cap back. Sure, I said. I guess. <laughs> Not really. No! Should we have talked this over before, Paul said. But your mom and dad are so not into pigeonholing people. Were we all being so liberal we left you out? Mr. McLeod told us about people who will write their fears on your face. That's good, Uncle Paul said. You have to be ready for people like that. My head was still kind of whirling. Grandpa, Dad, Uncle Paul, Mr. McCoy, those were the four I wanted to be. Uncle Paul, do you think I might be gay? I don't know, he said. Do you moisturize? <laughs> <laughs> what? Where do you stand on exfoliation? I'm not sex and you didn't pick that shirt yourself, did you tell me you did? Yeah. Uncle Paul, you're kidding me, right? I'm half kidding, he said. One more thing then, I said. You love men, right? I love one man, he said. And that's an epiphany. I was inspired to the moisturizing by Mr. John Caton in your bar. He takes a little each to write my books. Uh, that scene, the son of that scene, is inspired by George Will, another Illinois like me, who, who wrote a wonderful little book called A Nice Little Place on the, West, on the North Side about, it's the history of Wrigley Field. This is the first novel I ever wrote on the basis of legislation. Who knew? <laughs> but I began it on June 14th, uh, 2016, the day same-sex marriage was implemented in my home state, Illinois. And before I could get the novel done, well, before I could get the novel done, it was the law of the land. And then I thought, and I thought, what are we have people hearing about this at school? Grade school? We always get to them too late, and then other people do our jobs. Do they know that in America, marriage is everybody's right? It's not in the textbook and will not be in my lifetime. And it's not on the standardized test that rules schools. So, but history has happened, and attention must be paid. Elizabeth and I are both fueled by history. Counting on Grace's, Grace is set in 1910, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I'm happier in the past, and I love teaching a little history in books, because I'm not so sure what they're learning in school about history, and how it's still happening. And after all, I fell in love with history in the past, not in school but within the pages of Red Badge of Courage and Gone with the Wind, a novel that could not be published today, but I read it in freer times. <laughs> but then all novels are historical novels before the ink is dry, and that was double when your favorite readers were born in the 21st century, and will still be here and reading in the 22nd.
grateful and thankful for Mr. Peck and Ms. Winthrop for sharing their ideas, their books, their secrets, their amazing characters with us today. Um, and we just thank them from the bottom of our hearts for coming. And we're so glad that you all joined us. Uh, are there any questions for the authors? Yes. Uh, Richard, uh, this may be trivia, but did I hear you say that you write with a different voice when you stand up? Yes. yes. Could you expand on that? Yes, it's more conversational. Um, and less passive. When you're sitting down, you're too comfortable. When you're standing up, you're energized by the cocktail party or making a speech or being called on and told to stand up. And uh, it's got more energy. And you can see it when you re rewrite and revise. That line, that line's moving in these arms. Another thing you didn't touch on, and is partly in answer to that, and that is you read each sentence to see if it scans. Uh, uh, prose owes a lot to poetry, and there is no poetry in some writers' souls. Because I don't know how to get it, but you better have it. And you better look at a line and say, that line's droopy, and usually you know what it is, it's too long. Um, if you're writing, standing up, the sentences are shorter too. <laughs> and that's all typical. I get two sentences in my first line of the new book. And you use your hands when you're reading out loud. Yes. It's like a theatrical. Yes. Like people walking down the street on, on a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that for? <laughs> yeah. 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 Reading out loud, so both of you, or or Richard, when you're when you're standing up, how are you standing up? I'm trying to think. Where am I going to stand up? I'll stand. Do I put? Do you have a podium like that at home? Why do you stand up and write? No, I'm not that far gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just wander around my room and all that. Another you reason I don't think I should be writing in this way. <laughs> yeah. And when you and Elizabeth, when you read aloud, do you read? Ten pages. Um, I'm holding a page, and, and, and I walk by and I put that one down and I pick this okay. one up. So I've been to the cemetery. <laughs> yes, Thank it's you. so easy to be there. Okay. John Steinbeck, who lived across the street from me on Seventy Second Street, had a, a tall desk and wrote stand, wrote everything stand. <laughs> and Henry James. Thomas Newman. He looks like a sedentary writer. Any other questions? Yes, and feel, but just don't get the right name. And if you had that problem, how would you solve it? Do you ever use a phone book, or what do you do? <laughs> well, my characters, I mean, in, in the case of the Castle in the Attic, it's a uh, time travel book. So what, I needed a British royal name. So William made perfect sense to me. Grace, and counting on Grace, comes from that period. There were many children named Grace. <coughs> the title, in that case, took me forever to find. And it was, in the end, the perfect title because Counting on Grace, there was a kind of a spiritual element to it. Plus, uh, the mother counts on Grace to dock the, the uh, frames <coughs> as quickly as she can. And in addition, Grace turns out to be very good at math. So she does counting for her family. So it had a three-way. Yeah. So Grace was, but as far as I, I think that I, if I don't have the right um, name for a character, the book doesn't move. It does not move. Right? I think Grace is coming back. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's, a, that's important. Also, we've written more than 100 books between us, and you go through a lot of names. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and it's probably all right. It's mostly out of print. So right. saying, but uh, you don't want to do that again, because somebody will catch you. Okay. Say, is that the same character? <laughs> I was I was telling Randy earlier. In, I mean, I've written since '72. My first novel was published in 1974. Well, if I go out now and someone puts up their hand and says, "Now, why did Jennifer do blankety blank?" and I think, "Who the hell is Jennifer?" <laughs> <laughs> and so I sort of say, "Tell me more." They think you can retain everything, yeah. and they've just read the book. Yes. So somebody said so. It's totally a lie for them. But yes. 
I have letters that say, what did you mean on page 49 without mentioning the book? <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite letter, our teacher told us to write for our favorite novel, but could you get me the address of Daniel Steele? <laughs> I was putting words in their mouths, which is what you have to do. And eight months later, a boy who is concerned about his uncle's romance that he's not pursuing it well. This is highly unlikely for an 11 year old boy to concern himself with, but this is an awful lot of So he says to his dad, who is concerned too. Can we talk some sense into my uncle? And he said, and the dad says, and I didn't know he was going to say, no, we'll talk about cars and the cars. <laughs> and he said, well, that do me good. And the dad says, you work with what you've got. <laughs> and I knew I had an uncle. Yes. <laughs> For me, a lot like that. Now, uh, the only book that came to me wholesale is a very young picture book called Shoes. And it just kept, it just kept coming out. In fact, I sent it to the editor. They said, we're going to publish it. And when they sent me back the galleys, I said, you're missing a whole last page. And they said, oh, that must have fallen out of the envelope. We didn't need it. So, <laughs> but uh, in Counting on Grace, uh, Lewis Hine comes to spend the night at Grace's house, and she's very smart because she's charged him a dollar, and the mother normally charges 50 cents for, for visiting boarders where they make some money. And he uses the basement as a dark room, and he, he uh, develops the picture. He's taken this picture he's taken of Grace, and she says, who's that worried old woman looking at herself? And he says, that's the face you see in the mirror every morning. And she says, we don't got in the mirror. Mm. And that just said, you know, that, then you knew what, what she really was looking It's a joyous moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you hit that. Mm -hmm. There's a paradox in what you both said, which is that you want to activate your, the people in your books, but you yourself have to be incredibly, unbelievably patient mm -hmm. and, in fact, Passive. How do you weather that? How do you, you know, how do you make that transition? How do you be patient enough to put all that filler in for a novel? It seems superhuman to me listening to you guys. Say that again in one sentence. I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're saying that you need to get out of the book's way. Yes. But you need to live the book. 
and there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's it seems okay. it's a process, and I I was lucky. I never had a teacher who said write what you know, <laughs> express yourself. Boys don't like that. They've got secrets. Yeah. Girls will tell you. Boys won't. Huh. Uh, so I I have no great urge to to hear myself. I, and also, I was a teacher. I know how long the, the students would listen to me and how long they would listen to each other. Guess who won? <laughs> <laughs> so that was helpful. Also, I have always said, if I could have lived my life, I wouldn't have to be a writer. I spent all of my life trying to figure out what other people were doing. Mm -hmm. So writing was an easy transition in that way. For me, I agree with what Richard says. The whole, the beauty of the moment I always say that when you are trying to create a book, it's like there's been a snowstorm and you've got a little bit of a snowball and you're pushing it up the hill and it does get bigger and bigger. But there comes this moment when you're at the top of the hill and it starts down and you're running after it. Hmm. And that's the moment when you walk in your writing room and there are characters sitting there saying, well, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to go out for breakfast. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's that whole energy that then you're just you're just recording, and it's not that you have to you of course have to polish and clean it up, but they are alive yeah. and living, and there's nothing like that. Moment. We yeah. always search for it, and it start every book doesn't teach you how to write all the other books. It only teaches you how to write that book. So you start every time at the beginning, waiting for that golden moment. So I have a question. Oh, you have a question? Yes. Yes, for Christy. Can you tell me the last <laughs> writing assignment a teacher gave your class? Um, I, I am next class. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, the most recent writing assignment I have was actually um, um, a um, challenge that I have overcome. A challenge I have overcome. Yeah. How did wow. you feel about that assignment? Will you share with us what the challenge? Um, it's dyslexia. Dyslexia. <laughs> and maybe one day you will write about writes a book, it's like dodging a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I, uh, actually for me right now, I'm right at the edge of that because I'm working on a memoir and nobody's going to be happy when I'm done. <laughs> That's those, that territory. Yeah. Well, I never wrote a line in fiction until I was 37 years old and we moved in New York, a thousand miles from my origins. Uh, and we never Tell you our secrets. <laughs> Dirty laundry is never on the line, but reputation's off. Mm -hmm. So it never occurred to me. Then I found out later they were all holding their breath. Yeah, yeah, I bet they were. Mm -hmm. Because, because they, they seemed to think they were interesting enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was in New York. <laughs> I actually did have a family that uh, was holding its breath and dodging bullets, but also. Uh, could provide one with a great deal of fodder. Oh, well, mine too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I waited for them to be dead. Yeah, well, <laughs> the new book I'm talking about, the title is The Children of Spies. Yes. So, yes. there's it's definitely. Yes. Uh, and we know who the spies are. Yeah. Would you care to say? Uh -huh. Well, my, my family, my father was a famous writer named Stuart Alsop. Oh, and yeah. I'm writing about growing up in Cold War, Washington. Uh, through a whole period of time with him. And 
experience they had for Hoover and the Kennedys and so on. So there are a lot of secrets there that could be released. Um, but I'm looking very much at the family secrets, not, yes. not interested in the family that's what people are more interested in. That's what I'm more interested in. So. I have one last question. How do you know when it's time to stop mm -hmm. rewriting and revising and that the book is actually ready for its public. Well, as I told you, I got it all wrong with the book. I had no ending or title, so <laughs> I'm not a good example. So someone has to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yes, I had you told. Yeah, I think in fact that that's true. Although I wrote a novel called In My Mother's House for adults, and uh, I had a whole last chapter that I just thought was going to be so brilliant. It was set in, in Connecticut and. Uh, in my my grandmother's house in Connecticut, the the Italian workers that my grandfather had brought over from Lake Garda to work the dairy farm, their grandchildren bought the farm and turned it into a golf course. Mm -hmm. And they called it Bel Campo. And when my uncle went to hit the you know champagne across the sign, and the sign was revealed, he turned to Aldo Morelli and he said, "You spelled Campo." because he took Italian in boarding school and it's spelled campo, C-A-M-P-O. And it says C-O-M-P-O. And Aldo looked at Uncle John and said, ah, who cares, we're all Americans now. <laughs> <laughs> this is a perfect last chapter for my book. <laughs> Got to the penultimate chapter and thought, no, that, that, that whole scene doesn't belong in the book. <laughs> so oh. it, it's just funny how yeah. the book tells you the book tells you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Any final questions? Yes, please. Uh, what do you do about writer's block? Great. What do you do about writer's block? Well, there's a government agency that will help you. <laughs> it's called the IRS. <laughs> uh, if you, writing for a living is easier than writing for a grade. Yeah. Uh, and I am allowed hit my own deadlines. That doesn't solve everything, but I am now participating in the process. Uh, and my editor doesn't say, uh, well, your deadline is March. She says, if you want on the fall list of 18, I'll leave the manuscript in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, I do want it. <laughs> I want in, I want in, I want in. Uh, so that's how that works. Uh, also, we're unemployed, aren't we? We get a lot done. <laughs> the other thing is, if you're stuck on one story, go over here and start another story. And come, it'll come back. You'll come back to it. I find I often need two or three things happening in my head. And if you get locked on one, you can often pick up another, or I write poetry. Wow, that's what that's I good. do. That's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Poetry clarifies so much. Yeah. And because it, there's white space on yeah, the page. There's yeah. white space. And the final thing is what Ernest Hemingway said, which is never leave something in the middle. Do I never leave something at the end of a chapter or the end of a paragraph? I, if I'm going away and I'm not going to write for the rest of the day, I'm coming back the next day, it's the middle of a sentence. <laughs> wow. I've started a sentence, and I haven't finished. about 9.30 to 1.30. And then I do I do other stuff in the afternoon, you know, loyalty problems or travel or in the afternoon. What about you, Richard, no? I don't know when I write, I don't know how I did it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder now because of email. Mm -hmm. And people send me you a separate message for every piggling detail. <laughs> in a composition, you know the speckled things that say composition 1824 and a half or whatever. 
and I filled up every single line right to the end. I yeah. determined the plot, the turn of the plot, was it going to finish at the end? And I took it in to show it to my teacher, and I left it on the school bus. Oh. Never saw it again. Oh. So I decided I wanted to be a tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned out to be a better writer than a tennis player. So I went back to Did you write it yourself? No, I didn't. I was doing homework. <laughs> My father was a writer at home, and we always said he had a sign on his door. I have five brothers, so there were six of us in the house. We always said he had a sign on his door that said, please don't knock unless you're bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sort of the idea. So I did come in in the afternoon, and I drew the old Underwood typewriter piece, and I thought, wow, you know, we're all, we've got a roof over our head, we have shoes, we can eat. And I once said to him, no, I, I think I'm going to be a writer, because it's kind of easy. You know? <laughs> children's book you read, either of you, that inspired you to be children's book writers, or just any books in general that inspired you to write? Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's, it's still very near me. When I was in fourth grade, in Dennis School in Decatur, Illinois, there was no library, but there was Mrs. Cole, fourth grade teacher, and there were 43 of us in her class, and it's swollen by World War II, and she never got up from her desk for him. Uh, but one day she came up behind me on my blind side and handed me a book and said, here, you might try this. Notice the verb, try, not like. <laughs> Adults weren't very interested in what children like to them, which made us want to be adults. Uh, it was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Mm -hmm. And I went home and tried it. I'm still trying it. <laughs> uh, but I, when I saw what could happen on the page, in the middle of the United States, in a river I had seen. Mm -hmm. I was on my way. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer because I could read a 19th century novel cover to cover in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Not because I was gifted, but because the teacher had complete authority in the classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how about you, Elizabeth? Was there a favorite? Um, my mother is British, and so I have a lot of British novels. I was exposed to a huge number of British novels, and they all, I, I honestly think it was um, The Borrowers, um, yeah. that whole concept. Of, I, I didn't know I was going to be a children's book writer. I went to Sarah Lawrence College where I was allowed to major in writing, which was the whole reason I went there. And I wrote, and I wrote short stories, and hundreds of terrible short stories, all about <laughs> adults. I knew nothing about being an adult. And uh, after I'd taken every course in three years of college, I finally took writing for children. And I thought, well, I, I'm only, only a child, so I better write for children. And, it, it, and then I went to work at Harper and Row in the old days. I was an editor under Ursula Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. And I worked with Charles Dolittow, and Shel Silverstein walked in every day, or Arnold LaBelle, and it was like, this is where I belong. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Let's give them a minute.